Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards, where no ship is safe from being called a piece of ship. Regular listeners may remember my opinion of your planet's primitive, chemically propelled slug throwers, and whether or not I consider them primitive or not, and I totally do, the fact is they remain one of the best personal defense tools on your planet. Which is why this particular week's episode is sponsored by Operation Blazing Sword. OBS was founded to educate anyone on the basics of slug thrower safety and operation, but the interesting thing is that its roots are actually in the LGBTQ plus community and specifically encouraging them to learn how to safely and responsibly defend themselves against potential aggressors. As such, all of the 1,559 instructors at the time of this ad recording are volunteers and who are willing to teach anyone how to safely and responsibly use these slug throwers that are on your planet if your various countries allow you to do that kind of thing. And the cool thing about the instructors is that they did volunteer to bankroll your first trip to the range. So whether you enjoy it or not, whether you want to continue it or not, you might just have a fun time blasting away at a target. You've literally got nothing to lose except your time, and I doubt that will actually be a waste. So maybe look up Operation Blazing Sword and their sister organization, whose name YouTube would probably get cranky at me if I actually quoted, but their tagline is absolutely beautiful. Armed queers don't get bashed. And speaking of slug throwers and projectiles and all the rest of that nonsense, the question is frequently posed to me as to what difference is there if any, between missiles and torpedoes in a science fiction space-based setting? The short answer is that there isn't really one, at least not in any meaningful sense or in any kind of broad stroke. The slightly longer answer is that thanks to various IPs, notably Star Wars, their differences can largely be summed up as the following. Missiles are basically Gretchens entirely soaked in red paint and flung at the enemy, while torpedoes are more equivalent to the hunter-seekers from Dune. Now, let's get into why. And actually, I should probably explain those analogies, shouldn't I? You see, for those of y'all who do not play Warhammer 40,000, Gretchens are the smaller, weaker brothers, cousins of the orc species. The Gretchens may be more equivalent to goblins than anything else, and that's a pretty common touchpoint for comparison, I suppose. They are small, they are weak, they don't do a whole lot of damage, they are even more cannon fodder than the orcs themselves. If there were enough of them, I suppose they might do enough damage to be an actual real threat, but individually, they're not so much. Concurrently, the entire orc species pretty much operates on faith. Their technology is nothing more than a bucket of bolts that they believe will be a spaceship, and suddenly it is. They also, speaking of faith, firmly believe that anything painted red will go fast. The more red it is, the faster it'll go. So yeah, imagine a tiny, misshapen, scrawny dude wielding a really oversized knife for his particular size, just coming screaming at you while covered in red paint. That's basically missiles and science fiction stories. On the other hand, hunter-seekers are painfully slow. They are an assassin's weapon from the Duneverse, and they are slow for at least two reasons. The first of which is basically stealth. They get, they get by by being very small and very slow, and hoping you just don't notice them cruising by. And yeah, they are one of the few true hover systems in the Duneverse, at least on Arrakis. They, they get to actually fly without wings, without propellers, without anything, by way of a Holtzman generator. And you might remember that name from our episode on the Highliners. The Holtzman engine is how the Highliners bend space. Well, it turns out that whole Holtzman guy, he made something that was applicable to making shields, making uh, flying vehicles making floating, glowing balls, and making faster than light travel. So, yeah, his development touched a broad spectrum of things. That's what she said? Anyways, the uh, the Hunter Seeker, yes, it's slow, again, for stealth, but also because in the Duneverse, like I mentioned, there are shields. These shields protect against anything moving fast, and especially against lasers, although that... mm, We'll talk about that in a later episode, but definitely against things moving fast. So the whole reason that knife fighting is a thing in the Duneverse is because it's an easy way to kill someone who is personally shielded. Okay, fine. It's not an easy way. You have to defeat them in combat, but you can't just shoot them repeatedly with a machine gun or something because the bullets won't go through. 
On the other hand, if you can slide a knife slowly through their shield, it will kill them. And that's basically the same premise the Hunter Seeker uses. It's a very small device, and it has a very small needle inside of it, coated in basically an immediate, probably neurotoxin, some kind of poison, some kind of very, very quick-acting poison, to the point where if you get even so much as nicked by one, you will be dead in seconds. There is no recovery, it doesn't require multiple shots, you just did. But like I said, it's slow, and it does have a Holtzman Field generator on it, which does make a little bit of noise. So, if you can discover that one is coming after you, you might be able to destroy it before it kills you. But that's just a maybe. So there you go. I explained the joke. I'm told that's a horrible practice to get into, but, I mean, this is supposed to be a moderately, marginally, possibly educational channel. So, like I said, there you go. Now, before we get into the true nuts and bolts of the differences of missiles and torpedoes in science fiction, and again, there basically aren't any, let's talk about what those different systems are on your planet right now. Ironically, throughout your history, the term missile referred to any kind of projectile that was thrown, shot, or propelled towards the target. So a bullet is a missile, a rock is a missile, a missile is a missile, a torpedo is by some interpretation of that definition, a missile. So, yeah, the, the language here at play is already somewhat confusing. But typically, when someone is saying missile in the military sense, they are referring to a guided airborne ranged weapon capable of self-propelled flight, usually by a jet engine or rocket motor. Now, there's a few interesting omissions in that definition I'd really like you to pay attention to. For example, it does not specify that the weapon has to be explosive or any kind of like nuclear, explosive, fragmentary, any kind of like warhead type thing. And in fact, there are a variety of missiles, the, the actual propelled variety as opposed to the just thrown variety that don't mount warheads because they're just going fast enough to why bother. Actually, we'll talk about that in a later episode as well. Secondly, it doesn't really specify what the missile is targeting or where it's coming from. It could be surface to surface, it could be surface to air, it could be air to air, it could be air to surface, or air to ground, I think is how they commonly refer to it. But that's where the modifiers come in. You've got SAMs, surface to air missiles. You've got SRBMs, short range ballistic missiles. You've got intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. You've got all these other things. You've got like HARMs which is basically one of those acronyms you shoved into fitting because it technically stands for High Speed Anti-Radiation Missile. Where did the S go? I have no idea. Also, as always, the rule of acronym seems to apply. If someone says SAM Missile, they're saying Surface to Air Missile Missile. Because, I mean, yeah, ATM machine is a thing, right? Now, one of the important distinctions between missiles and torpedoes is that they are airborne. Missiles are airborne. Now, another important distinction is, yes, rockets are a thing, but typically speaking, rockets are unguided. There are such a thing as guided rockets, but you do have to put that uh, prefix in front of the term rocket. And at that point, there's not a lot differentiating them from missiles. So you might as well call them a missile. Undoubtedly, there's a whole pile of artillerymen and rocketmen in my uh, audience that just bristled at that. But you know what? Get over it. Anyways, the upshot of all of this is missiles are typically light and typically fast. Now, for um, aircraft, they are almost certainly a one-hit kill. For ground targets, it's a little more complicated. For ships, it really depends on what kind of missile you're using. There are dedicated ship killers, and you can hit ships with other kind of missiles too. So it's all kind of complicated. Likewise, there are typically countermeasures against missiles that don't always involve shooting the missile down. And the missile itself may have countermeasures for those countermeasures. Its programming may accommodate such things as flares or chaff, and it may be able to make evasive maneuvers to avoid being shot down if you have the capabilities to do that. So, like I said, a bright red Gretchen coming screaming at you with a pistol or a small knife. Yeah, you don't want that. No matter how small he is, he's still going to fuck up your face. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, amusingly, the story isn't that different. Um, so torpedoes, as you know them now, are underwater ranged weapons launched above or below the water surface that propel themselves towards a target and use an explosive warhead designed to detonate either in contact with the target or probably directly underneath it to break its keel. Okay, that's how you know them now. 
The problem is that's a basically 1900-ish reinterpretation of the term. Before 1900-ish, torpedoes were what you now know of as mines. Naval mines, specifically. They were either contact explosives tethered to the bottom of the ocean floor, or they were what were called spar torpedoes. They were on a stick sticking out in front of a warship, and when the warship almost rammed another ship, the stick would hit first and set off the torpedo, and boom, the other ship would hopefully go away. So yes, when Rear Admiral David Farragut made his possibly apocryphal proclamation, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, he was actually referring to what you now know of as mines placed in and around the harbor of Mobile, Alabama. In fact, it was a pretty chonky minefield when you get right down to it. But now you have locomotive torpedoes, or automobile torpedoes, or automotive torpedoes. Hmm. Or fish torpedoes. Ah, see that one you've heard before, because I'm sure you have watched Hunt for Red October, or Das Boot, or Crimson Tide, or of course the best documentary of the submarine force ever produced, and that of course is Down Periscope. And I'm pretty sure in all of those movies, the phrase fish in the water is uttered at least once. That means someone somewhere in auditory range of the submarine has launched a torpedo and everyone needs to pucker up. Anyways, the first, very first, self-propelled naval torpedo was designed by a gentleman by the name of Robert Whitehead. Although he designed it for the Austro-Hungarian monarchy out of what is now known as Croatia. So, a bit of cross-pollination there, huh? And those first torpedoes were what were called straight runner surface skimmers. They went in a straight line as best as they could with currents and waves and whatever upsetting their paths. And they floated up to near the surface, but just under the surface, and basically stayed there until they ran into something. And yes, they were contact fused. They weren't anything complicated or exciting. Modern torpedoes, or rather your current torpedoes, on the other hand, well, that's a whole different story. For the Australians, Netherlanders, Canadians, Brazilians, and USAans in the audience, it was a fairly common saying that the Mark 48 ad cap torpedo was about as smart as an average chihuahua. Now, I don't know a whole lot about dogs, but I'm guessing something that small can't be that smart. But still, it's a torpedo with a pretty big warhead that's probably about as angry as those little things seem to be and almost as smart. The, 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 this is not a good thing. And worse, the ad cap is technically two-ish generations behind. Now they've got the sea bass. Uh, Charlie, Bravo, Alpha, Sierra, Sierra, although sea bass does actually sound pretty good. And those are apparently even more terrifying. But okay, anyways, the upshot is uh, the Mark 48 can be wire guided. They can also just be cut off and left to their lonesomes and be told a target and go look for it on their own. And they are smart enough to not only go look for that specific target, because every ship has a different harmonic signature on their screw, and that's a separate topic, never mind, but they know the target and they can go find it like, you know, an average dog can go find something. But they're also smart enough to wait to see if the target comes back. If they don't find the target within a certain time period, and that time period can vary, and maybe I'm just making all of this up, they'll just shut down and float for a bit, and wait at the same depth that they were at, and see if it comes back. And then once they do find their target, and they will find their target, they don't run into it. That's for chumps. Oh no, they use magnetic sensors along the torpedo's length to come up underneath the target, blow up, make a massive cavitation underneath that target, and snap its keel like it was fucking dry spaghetti. I'm not going to say that modern torpedoes are a one-shot kill on modern carriers. They will certainly get the carrier's attention, but it might be able to limp away. Anything smaller than the carrier, though, is cooked. And it doesn't help that a whole pile of ships don't even have the equipment necessary to detect a torpedo incoming. Like, say, the entire amphibious fleet of the United States Navy does not really have sonar. Now, technically, they're supposed to be out there with destroyers and cruisers who do have sonar. But literally, the whole point of submarines is to sneak up on things and kill them when they're not expecting it. We talked about this in a previous episode. The whole why there were Q-ships thing, right? But anyways, despite being basically a one-hit kill on almost anything, they were pretty slow in comparison to missiles, at least. In comparison to everything else in the world, I mean, okay, 
Mark 48 ad caps weigh about 3,700 pounds, give or take. That's 16, 1,700 kilograms and that other metric system. For clarification, that is more than a four-door Honda Civic weighs. And part of that weight is a 650-pound or 290-ish kilogram warhead. Also, there was a butt-ton of auto fuel on board this thing. Not only auto fuel, but auto fuel too. And we'll talk about that later. But basically, it's a self-oxidizing fuel. You don't want that. And that's counted as part of its explosive payload because it's a self-oxidizing fuel. I shouldn't have to explain that. All right, we've got this heavier than a Honda Civic thing that can pull, I don't know, a max speed of about 55 knots. Oh yeah, that's not too bad, right? Oh no, that's actually 63 miles an hour or 102 kilometers an hour through the fucking water. Your Civic only has to worry about going through the air. The torpedo's plowing through water at 63 miles an hour. That's not terrifying at all. And also there's basically no surface ship that cannot run that, which is kind of the point. And there's definitely no submarine that cannot run that. So again, kind of the point. Now, again, there are countermeasures you can use against torpedoes. And in fact, one of the countermeasures that submarines specifically and surface ships to a very limited extent can employ is shooting back at the torpedo. If you get that fish in the water signal fast enough and you already have a torpedo lined up, hopefully in a tube, you can tell it to go find that other torpedo and kill it. Might work? Probably won't. So yeah, there you go. The basic difference between missiles and torpedoes. Amusingly, missiles differentiate themselves from rockets by way of guidance, whereas torpedoes used to be unguided and now are guided and no one ever changed the term. But either way, in comparison, torpedoes tend to be low, slow, heavy, and big boom, whereas missiles tend to be fast, nimble, and light. In terms of both overall weight and in terms of throw weight, how much damage they can possibly do. Now, again, like I said, they are intended for different targets, but this still carries over into the science fiction universe. And I'll still go back to Star Wars because it conveniently has both concussion missiles and proton torpedoes. Concussion missiles are largely meant for deployment against other star fighters, not capital ships. I mean, they can do damage against capital ships, but they're really best suited for fighters because fighters tend to be fast and nimble themselves and the concussion missiles can chase them down. Whereas proton torpedoes, almost every fighter except possibly a Y-wing can get inside of its turn radius and break lock. On the other hand, against capital ships, proton torpedoes are perfect. You can knock off turrets, you can knock off other warhead launchers, you can knock off whatever you want. Those things just bury right through the shields and do all kinds of damage because they're torpedoes. On the other hand, if the capital ship or its fighters are quick on the bubble, they can shoot the torpedoes down. It's actually not that hard in most of the games. And then on the other hand, there are universes like Expanse, where they use the term missile and the term torpedo pretty much interchangeably, which is my larger point. In space, there would be no functional difference between a missile and a torpedo. I mean, yeah, one might be heavier and slower and bigger and boomier and so on and so forth, and the other might be faster and nimbler and less concerning. But they're still basically the same vehicle doing basically the same job, just with different payloads and different engine loadouts. Same basic premise, though. So if you want to call them missiles, call them missiles. If you want to call them torpedoes, call them torpedoes. If you want to use the delineation of one is light and fast and the other is slow and uh, heavy, do that. It doesn't really matter, honestly. And if you want to make it really fun, instead of a torpedo that drops Mervs on its way to the target, and that is, well, heh, multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles, and I suppose if the, the vehicles are not going through re-entry, Merv would be a bad term, but still, instead, if you don't want the torpedo just to dump dumb warheads at the target and kind of like a flying claymore kind of maneuver, have a torpedo that launches missiles, because... Yo, dog, I heard you like torpedoes, so I put missiles in your torpedo so you could missile while you torpedoed. And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the docks for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.